I just wish we were together. That way we could have a piece of cake, a little glass of wine, a morsel of bread. So here's our meditation today. It's coming from the community rule in the Dead Sea Scrolls. My translation of this excerpt. By his truth, Elohim will then purify all human acts. This is what's coming up. Refining some people to exorcise every perverse spirit from the inward parts of the flesh, cleansing them from every vile act by a set-apart spirit. Like purifying waters, he will sprinkle each one with the spirit of truth, effective against all the abominations of lying and corruption by an unclean spirit. By this means, Yah will give the upright insight from the knowledge of El Elyon, along with the wisdom of the Malachim, making those following the perfect way wise. Yay! Elohim has chosen them for an ever-enduring covenant. That's you. All Adam's honor will become theirs alone. Perversity will be extinct. Every deceitful deed will be put to shame. Until now, the spirits of truth and perversity have contended within the human heart. All people walk in both wisdom and foolishness. As is a person's granting of truth and righteousness, so will that one hate perversity. Conversely, in proportion to his grantings in the lot of evil, one will act vilely and to test truth. Elohim has the appointed has appointed these spirits as equals until the announced time and the renewal. He foreknows the results of their actions through all ages of time. He has granted these spirits dominion over humanity so to impart knowledge of good and evil in order to decide the fate of every living being by the measure of whichever spirit predominates until the day of the appointed visitation. And on that day, of course, all this evil, evil in the world will be put away. This is the rule for those of the Ahad who come forward to repent from all evil and to hold fast to all that he, by his goodwill, has commanded. They are to separate from the perverse congregations. They are to come together as one. They are to practice truth together with humility, charity, justice, loving kindness, and modesty in all their ways. As a result, none will continue in a willful heart and thus be seduced. No, not by the heart, neither by the eyes, nor yet by the lower nature. Together, they will circumcise the foreskin of this nature, this stiff neck, and so establish a foundation of truth for Israel, that is, for the Ahad of the Enduring Covenant. They are to atone for all those in Aaron who volunteer to be set apart, Kadosh, and for those in Israel who belong to truth, and for Gentiles who join them. Today, I'm going to ask you to go to your favorite translation on your screen for Matthew chapter 1. If you can bring that up, I want you to go through it with me. And we're going to do a little speculating. What's Matthew trying to tell us in his Toledot, his genealogy in the first chapter? It's important that you take a look at a translation that you like because I'm going to be going through a translation that you're probably not familiar with at all. It's my own translation of the genealogy of the family of Dawid, and it's from the Aramaic version rather than the Greek version. Matthew 1, 1. A roll, that is a scroll, 
Toledot Yeshua HaMashiach Ben David Ben Avraham. Avraham fathered Yitzchak, Yitzchak fathered Yaakov, Yaakov fathered Yehuda and his Akim. Verse 3. Yehuda fathered Feretz and Zerach of Tamar. Important. Feretz fathered Kezron. Kezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadav. Aminadav fathered Nakshun. Nakshun fathered Salmon. And verse 5, Salmon fathered Boaz of Rechav. Boaz fathered Oved of Root. Oved fathered Yishe. Yishe fathered Dawid Hamelech the king. Dawid fathered Shlomo of the wife of Uriah. Shlomo fathered Rechavam. Rechavam fathered Abiyah. Abiyah fathered Asa. Eight. Asa fathered Yehoshaphat. Yehoshaphat fathered Yoram. Yoram fathered Uziyahu. Nine. Uziyahu fathered Yotam. Yotam fathered Akaz. Akaz fathered <laughs> Kitzkiyahu. Kitzkiyahu fathered Manasseh in ten. Manasseh fathered Amon. Amon fathered Yoshiyahu in eleven. Yoshiyahu fathered Yakana. Uh, Yakan Yahu and his Akim, his brothers, sisters, about the time of the exodus to Babel, Babylon. After the exodus to Babel, Yakan Yahu fathered Shealtiel, Shealtiel fathered Yarub Yarubavel, Yarubavel fathered Akiud, Avikud, Avikud fathered Elikim. Eliakim fathered Azur, Azur fathered Zadok, Zadok fathered Yakin, Yakin fathered Elikud, Elikud fathered Elazar, Elazar fathered Matan, Matan fathered Yaakov, and in 16, Yaakov fathered Yosef, the Gaura of Maria, to be explained. Of whom was born Yahshua called Mashiach. 17. So all the families from Abraham until Dawid are 14 families. And from Dawid until the Exodus to Babel are 14 families. And from the Exodus to Babel until the Mashiach are 14 families. All right, you can leave your screen on and we're going to go through some of this i know the people skip this section all the time because <laughs> it's begets it's begets it is boring but there is especially in matthew there's some meat in here that if we read between the lines we can learn something about messiah let me say the man messiah came first before the spiritual resurrected Messiah, he had to become man. Now, whether you believe in pre-existence or not doesn't make any difference. We have a man there, and that man is born into particular circumstances, and his circumstances were not good. Though in the Gospel of Luke, Everything's wonderful. There's a lot of prophetic words come through, and, and everything is copacetic, but not in Matthew. It's quite different here, especially, again, when we try to read between the lines. There's hidden manna in this Toledo, that is history or genealogy, of Maria. Now, I call her by her Aramaic name for this, and that is Maria. In Matthew chapter 1, it can lead us to quite a different conclusion about the person of Messiah, and especially concerning a great disadvantage that he may have endured through his birth and childhood. But it's only through reading between the lines here that we can get a glimpse of the master's hardship 
and a burden of prejudice that followed him through all his life in ministry, which we're going to see a same bur burden and hardship that a lot of children today must live through, and often with no help at all. What Matthew has given us as an introduction to his gospel isn't a genealogical record in the modern sense, but a record of legal inheritance demonstrating the succession of Yahshua in the royal and priestly line. It's the record of Maria's royal and priestly ancestral line. This is Mary's Toledot genealogy in uh, Luke chapter 3, I believe. Yes, there's Joseph's line, which you can read through. Uh, but in Matthew, obviously, we need more than the 42 generations that he mentions here to cover 4,000 years of ancestors. Since Adam, Luke goes back to Adam. This is not so when it comes to Matthew. Yet Matthew has a shortened version for us because completing the genetic record isn't his aim. Rather, he wants to demonstrate to his readers the succession of sovereigns, that is, kings, and the succession of priests that brought Yahshua into candidacy for the position of Messiah. That is his aim. So people try to compare Luke to Matthew genealogies, and they can't because they're not the same. They're, they are dissimilar completely, but still people try. They don't understand that Matthew is telling us by including five women in that genealogy, that there's something to be said about the fifth woman. Now, there are a few features of the list that are unique to biblical genealogies, family lists. If we look at verse 17, one of those anomalies is that he counts the generations at the end of the passage. He gets 14 from Adam to Dawid, from 14 from Dawid to the Exodus to Babel, and 14 from Babel to Messiah. 14, of course, is the number of David, Dawid, Dalit, Vav, Dalit. A Dalit is worth four. A Vav is worth six. And if we add them together, we get 14. So when we see 14 in the prophetic scriptures, then it is supposed to put us of a mind to looking back at the kingship of David and the priesthood of Zadok way back about 1000 BC, because that is one of Israel's claims to fame. And that fellow Dawid, in one form or the other, is the one that's to return here, king of kings, master of masters, and there we have the gematrial formula for the Messiah, David. In reading the last group of families from Babel to Messiah, we wonder if Matthew could count. Because actually, if you count those generations, there are not 14 there, but 13. Try it sometime. And note, Messiah has no father in the Aramaic version. No, Mary may not have had a husband in the Aramaic version. There's no mentioning of it here. Instead, she has a gaura, that is a guardian. Here's why. Many people think that Matthew was originally written in Aramaic, and if it was true in describing Maria, the mother of Messiah, Matthew doesn't give her a husband, a gura, but instead a gaura. And a gaura is a guardian, not necessarily a husband, while a gura is a husband. But gaura is a different word altogether, and that's the one that is used. You might want to check an Aramaic New Testament, go down to the footnote, and see what it says there concerning gaura. 
Can the English of our Bibles be trusted? It looks to me like a translator who took the passage from Aramaic and translated into Greek, confused those two words. They are very similar, gaura, gura, guardian, and husband, and gave Maria a husband rather than a guardian. It's what we find in the Greek Testaments and in the English versions. Young women were often assigned a guardian if they had no older male to rely on. This was true in the Jewish culture as well as in the Roman culture of that time. In fact, the guardian was a common practice, and some of the older widowers were willing to take the financial and emotional responsibilities, not just for the young woman who may have been in trouble, may have been completely alone, but also for her children. This is one of the hallmarks of the retired men of the Essenes and Qumran. This is something they would do in their mercy and in their faith in Elohim to be able to respond to the needs of their new family. So let's, for the sake of discovery, use that Aramaic version and assign Maria or Mary a guardian. His name is given as Yosef. And for the time being, let's consider him an older widower that came in to take over her financial and emotional burdens. Let's do it just for the sake of experiment, if nothing else, knowing that somewhere along the line, Yosef and Maria were indeed married. Now, I wonder, can anyone else see anything unusual in this genealogy that makes it unlike any other genealogy in the Bible. I know Marcel can because she's heard this about 800 times before. It's an important signature teaching. There's women in there, wives, mothers. So why? Matthew must be revealing some important significance of these five women, and only these five, since he singles them out so purposefully. I repeat, this is very unusual. I can think of only one other gene genealogical record in the Bible that has a woman listed. And of course, this is off the top of my head, so perhaps you can think of others as well. That genealogy is in 2 Chronicles 27, which is listing a woman and a very, very important woman for those who are believers in Yahshua as Messiah. So in 2 Chronicles, the woman's name is Yarusha. Let's see, did I give you a verse? I didn't, and I, I can't really remember which verse it is in 2 Chronicles, but you can find it. Yerusha or Jerusha. She was the mother of King Yotham, who we find in our reading today in verse 9. King Yotham. 2 Chronicles has Yerusha as his mother. King Yotham served Eight years as king, starting way, way back in 740 B.C. Yerusha was a granddaughter, so the text says, of the original Zadok the priest, whom David borrowed from the Jebusites, if you remember that story, and who served through David's and Solomon's reign. Now, why is Yotham and his mother even in there. Well, without her, there'd be no way to track Yahshua's claim to the Zadokite priesthood. There's several different priesthoods, but the Zadokite priesthood was the one that Elohim said in uh, Ezekiel 44 would have charge 
of the faith forever. And that's got to be a Zadokite priest, and that's got to be maybe Yahshua or some other one that had this inheritance. And with King Yotham in Matthew's genealogy as well, and I think I said verse 9, we can also see that Maria had a right to claim ancestry, both royal and priestly, by blood. There are kings in there. And Yotham is in there, whose mother was a Zadokite and a granddaughter of the great Zadok the priest. And thus, Yahshua is reckoned through Yotham and his mother to be valid along the priestly bloodlines. King and priest. And I think if the chronicler had known that he was proving the royalty and priestly credentials of one who the later Jews considered an imposter, he might have just left them both out of there. But thank goodness he didn't, because now we know. And all Judaism and the world can read that and know that Yahshua indeed was welcome to the priesthood and the kingship of Israel. And if the prophets are right about this king being the king of the world, then who else would it be but Yahshua, the anointed one? Now, if we go back to the text and pick those women out, we can do the same kind of sleuthing we've done to discover Yahshua's claim to the priesthood. And let me tell you, when I discovered that Chronicles section, I rejoiced. It was just a few years ago when we were first studying the Zadokite priesthood and the calendar to find that little section in there and just randomly reading it, happened to see it. And it, I remembered Jotham or Yotham was in the genealogy of Matthew. And then to see who his mother was, and to see right there written in the Second Chronicles that his mother was a daughter or granddaughter of Zadok, couldn't have been a daughter, it's too far, 300 years difference, but a granddaughter of Zadok. I thrilled at that because that was a piece missing from the puzzle of the Zadokite priesthood and Yahshua HaMashiach and his brothers. Now, the first four women we find on investigation may have some characteristics in common that Matthew is using to try to tell us that the fifth woman, Maria, had as well. Just a theory. A hope to learn more about the master and his mother that we don't already know, especially when we read Luke's story of the nativity of Yahshua. The story is so different and so um, optimistic. But here with Matthew and Herod and the, uh, the death of the children in Bethlehem and all these other things, not so much. It gives us a, a greater idea of the hardship Yahshua must have had in coming up even as a babe, as a child. And it's no wonder, I think, maybe when I get done with telling you about that, that he just kind of disappeared for 18 years. A lot of theories about what happened to him in the so-called lost years, but nobody really knows. But the information we might get from this and from these women is valuable for our ability to trust Elohim and trust in our eventual salvation. This information could be evidence, and indeed it is. Now, here's the women. Verse 3, we have Tamar. Verse 5, we have Rakhav. Verse 5b, we have Root. Ruth. 6b, we have the wife of Uriah. She's not even named. And then in verse 16 of Matthew 1, excuse me, 
we have Maria. Five special women pointed out. Let's consider these in order. We'll start with Tamar. Please hype up and say or consider what you might know about each of these women as we go along. There's not enough time to go into this in any great depth. In fact, I had to split this into a series of two messages, so we're not going to get to the bottom line today, but we will probably get through looking at these women. Tamar, we go back to Genesis 38, 24. You may know the story, but if you don't, and it came to be, Genesis 38, 24, that Yehuda, that is Judah, was informed, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has whored. And see, she has conceived by whoring. I believe this is the ISR. And Yehuda said, bring her out and let her be burned. 25. When she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man to whom these things belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please examine whose these are, this seal, this cord, and this staff. You know the story, I hope. I don't want to go into too deep on it. Of course, those things she had that she said belonged to the father of her child, which was Yehuda, to show the accuser who actually impregnated her. And it was none other than her father-in-law. Remember, her husband died. The, the father-in-law, Judah, would not give her, according to the Levirate message law, Levirate marriage law, would not give her the brother so she could have children with him, which was the custom at that time. And he held off and he held off. So she went down and sat by the road, knowing that her father-in-law frequented prostitutes. And she prostituted herself with him on purpose. Now, that was the story and became with child. And now he's wanting to send her out and be burnt, to be burnt as a punishment. But the people find out there that the father of the child was none other than the accuser of the daughter-in-law. So those things belong to the father-in-law, Yehuda. She had hoard all right, but chose her father-in-law as a customer and kept his payment so she might be later identifying him, which she did and which elicited the following confession from Judah in verse 26 of Genesis 38. Yehuda examined her and said, Oh, she's been more righteous than I, because I didn't give her to my son Shelah. And he never knew her again. That is, knew her in a biblical sense. You see, her husband... Yehuda's son, Er, E-R, he was so evil that Elohim did away with him, leaving Tamar childless. And by Tamar's law of levirate marriage, it was incumbent on the father-in-law to give her his son, other son, Shelah, to help make her a child. But he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. So she tricked him into giving her a son of himself through what turned out to be what we might call maybe a, a sin of righteousness. Really, a type of vengeance. The birth was very unusual, as the scripture goes on to relate a little later in Genesis 38, 27. At the time for giving birth, twins were in her womb. Oh, not just one, but two. And it came to be when she was giving birth that one twin put out his hand. And the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it to his hand, saying, 
This one came out first. And it came to be, as he drew back his hand, his brother came out instead. And she said, How did you break through? It's the midwife. So his name was called Peretz, which means breach, breach. And afterwards, his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand. So his name was called Zerah, which means breakthrough. See how they named people at that time with names that had something to do with their birth? Now, you've got to admit, several facets of this mating and birthing are quite unusual. Could Matthew be pointing these things out? Keep it in mind as we go to the next woman here, and that's Ruth. Ruth. Let's see if there's anything comparable with the next woman, Ruth. That is Tamar and Ruth in comparison. But remember that Ruth, like Tamar, was a foreigner, a Moabite, and she was a widow. And she may have been a captive woman as well, probably was taken from the Moabites in one of their many, many battles. For an Israelite was not to marry a woman of Moab or any outsider. And Moab, after all, was the enemy at this time. And up until this scripture story, Ruth and Boaz, her erstwhile husband, didn't even know each other, couldn't even recognize each other. And here is the passage from Ruth, Ruth 3 and 4, a little tongue-tied today. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to Ruth, when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, speaking of Boaz. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, okay. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her, mother-in-law Naomi. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he was a little tipsy, he went to lie down. Then she came and softly uncovered his feet and lie down herself. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are an avenger. And that's a whole other story there. She must have been under some kind of obligation to a master or an owner, that is Ruth, because he was an avenger, and she needed an avenger to get her out from under this, uh, this ownership thing here so she could marry again. Uh, avenger, that word is gaol, and it means a blood avenger. And he says, remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, if he'll let you go, good, let him do it. But if he's not willing to redeem you, then as Yahweh lives, I will redeem you. So just go lie down until the morning. This is after he spreads his wings over her. 14. So she lay at his feet until the morning and arose before one could even recognize the other. 15. And he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. And he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went to the city. And in 14 or 414, here we have the women saying unto Naomi, Blessed be Yahweh who hasn't left you without a kinsman. And his name may be famous in Israel. And he'll be to you a restorer of your life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has born him. And Naomi took the child 
and laid him on her bosom. This is Naomi, not Ruth. Not the one that bore the child. The child is turned over to the mother-in-law. And she became his nurse. And the neighborhood women gave him a name saying, this, there is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. That's a word that means slave or servant. He is the father of Yishe, the father of Dawid, Jesse, David. So he, she's important in the genealogy, not only of David, but also of Yahshua, I guess, because he's certainly mentioned in there. But this is strange, and I don't really know how to explain it any better than that. But according to the Midrash, that is the uh, oral Torah, I guess, Ruth was 40 years old. She wasn't a young woman when Boaz took her on, a fact that stresses the urgency of her desire to bear children. You find that in the Ruth Rabbah, 4-4, four, four, whatever that is. Time wasn't on her side at any rate. Uh, there are several peculiarities about this account and this birth. Ruth comes to his pallet and lays at his feet knowing this is an illegal union, though it appears that Boaz and Naomi are kin, but not Ruth. On the pallet, Boaz spreads his wings over her, a euphemism for you-know-what, before they even know each other and, or can even recognize each other, and then in the morning, Boaz pays her off in barley as though she were a prostitute. And in a real way, that's the disguise she took up there for this exchange. And it appears that this is the way she approached him, urged on by Naomi. Oh, we're so far away these days from that culture, and it's so strange to us. No wonder it's so hard to figure out. But this isn't unlike the story of Tamar, and Tamar is even mentioned at one point in this story in Ruth. She gives birth to a fellow she names slave, Obed, and relinquishes the newborn to her mother-in-law seemingly forever, as the town's women recognize the baby as belonging to Naomi, not Ruth. I wonder how old Naomi is if Ruth is 40. How old is her mother-in-law? Maybe Naomi is younger than Ruth. That's a possibility. And though Ruth is a foreigner, Boaz performs with her as though it were a liberate, liberate marriage, thus taking her into Israel through the birth of Obed. Hmm. There we have the same, uh, the same theme coming up again. Prostitution, strange birth. The next woman is Rakav. Now, there's no hiding it here. Rakav is a prostitute. So Bo Boaz himself, we talked about in the last section, was the son of a professional prostitute who had her own inn, her own brothel, called Beit Rakav, House of Rakav. And Salmon, who was her husband, was evidently one of the boarders and had been one of the customers of Rakov. Rakov, another woman mentioned in the genealogy of Matthew, was a Canaanite, a foreigner again, through a native, though a native to that land, who becomes a biblical heroine through an act of courage maybe desperation, could be even a divine calling, as we'll see. Remember that Joshua sends two spies who came to Beit Rakav for lodging, information, quite possibly sex. It was that kind of house. And for a price, she'll allow them to enter the fortress through a window that she shares with the city's wall. In exchange, they give her a thread, the color of blood, 
to hang on the outside of her house that serves a purpose not unlike the blood of the Passover in days gone by. That thread saves everyone in the house. Remember, when the Israelites see it, they pass it by. Rakab already knows the prophetic significance of Israel and the outcome of the Battle of Jericho ahead of time. So she's a harlot, but she's also a prophet. What do they call it? A harlot with a, with a heart of gold. The meeting between the spies and her appears to be a God thing. And as a result, she becomes a convert to Yahweh and a salvation figure, though she's an outsider and a sinner. But Salmon and Rakab's marriage isn't reported in Scripture, but we do know a little about him, that he was a contemporary of Yahashua at the time of his entry into the Promised Land with Yahashua or Joshua. Salmon came in to this Promised Land and met the giants and whatever else at the same time. So this goes back a long time. And we don't hear much about their son Boaz, other than what we've already learned from the uh, story of Ruth. But we do know something about Rakob, and that her and Ruth may very well be significant in learning what Matthew is trying to say about Maria, the mother of Messiah. Here's the same scheme again. Prostitution, unusual birth. I think there's one more, too, that will come to us toward the end. But what do they have in common? At least two or three things. I, want, I think I want to give you some homework for the next time. Take a look at these passages. I'll try to get the passages down in the chat, in your Bible, and see what you can find that three these three have in common. And actually, ahead of time for next week, I want you to look at the wife of Uriah, too. I want you to think about why did Matthew not name her? You think he just forgot the name? Look at that story, too. It's in 2 Samuel 11. Try to find something, a commonality between these four. Because next time we meet, I want to see if we can come down to a solution to what Matthew is saying about Yahshua and Mary when reading in between the lines of his Toledot. It's got to be something. It's got to be important. And indeed, it is important. And it's something that follows Yahshua from the time he is born all through his life all through the Gospels, probably one, the, one of the greatest hindrances that he had to becoming acclaimed the King of Kings and the Master of Masters. And here's where I will leave off until we meet again. Part one, part two coming up. And of course, I thank you for coming. Let's see if there's anything that anybody wants to share with us at this time. I have a meeting coming up Sunday night. That's tomorrow night, 8 o'clock p.m. If you want to join us, we're following the saints through Revelation. That is 144,000. People like to talk about that, but they really need to follow those guys through because they're mentioned in about five different chapters, and we see the, their entire history there in those chapters and little splashes here and there. And to know what they're up to, what their fate is, what they're for, is going to make a big difference in our understanding of who they are. Are they us? Are they the Jehovah Witnesses? Or are they people that have already been here done that, and gone. Paul? <laughs> yeah? Come see me there tomorrow night, 8 o'clock, before I expire.
Paul, did you have something to say? Yeah, I just had a quick question, if that's all right. Yeah. So uh, it was Yehuda who is it Yehuda that visited the his daughter in law, and she pretended to be a prostitute. Is that that's correct, right? I'm, yeah. I'm uh, I've read that several times. Mm -hmm. It just yeah. really uh, it really um, startles me, I guess, to think that we come in through Yehuda's that that whole line, and it's from. A, a prostitution experience so i'm like it I, it, uh, it just amazes me i was I, I also start to and then i start going a little deeper did you who to make did you who to make it you know is he is he in glory right now or because he did he practiced that on a regular basis i i just uh just a lot of these questions come into mind yahuda is dead awaiting the resurrection that's where he is right now. He's dead. In the resurrection of the just and unjust, he'll be coming forth according to the Bible. Now, that's not so for people who have been born again in this, dis I'm going to use this word generically, dispensation. Uh, people who are born again in Yahshua, they don't die. John chapter 5, they do not die. They this body of flesh just falls off because underneath it there's a different body a spiritual body that the natural man simply doesn't have so uh, we're in a different time and Yehuda undoubtedly is awaiting the resurrection he's dead he dies the next thing he knows like having an operation at the hospital the next thing you know is the resurrection so the idea of going into hell for a while and then being pulled out to be resurrected, then thrown back into hell, that's Catholic fable, along with a lot of the stuff, the, uh, the immortal soul. And I've got to tell you that this is my opinion based on intense study of this particular subject, because in churches, people want to know about this. And I've had the question numerous times from mothers in a congregation asking is is my son in hell he wasn't saved is he in hell or my husband killed himself is he in hell and i this is explanation is strictly from the scripture strictly from the mouth of the master and because of that the idea of the resurrection of the dead rather than being thrown at your death in hell or going up to heaven it's a lot more godly it's a lot more godly you could say no your son is not in hell he may end up being annihilated at the end but that boy when he's resurrected he's going to have as yahshua said a trial, a crisis, a trial, where everything that can be known about him is on the table as evidence. If he was, if he was harassed and abused in his childhood and growing up and beaten and whatever, that's taken into account. Everything's taken into account. We have read some accounts of near-death experiences where people there, first thing that happens to them when they die physically is that they have to watch a review of their lives, a complete review. Of course, time is different there, and that place and they see everything that ever happened in their life and what seems to be five to 20 minutes to them it's all very real they're surrounded by this evidence and they're asked questions about what do you think about this they're given that now these people in near-death experiences they really aren't dead they're brought back or they come back 
for one reason or the other, but I'm convinced that they go somewhere in spirit. And I can't explain it, but what happens to them is so biblical that it's either truthful or it is a huge deception, one of the two. And I can't just put something off as a deception without investigating. So anyway, what I'm saying is that Joshua, he'll be raised up in the resurrection, and undoubtedly, he will be adjudicated as being someone that is needed in the kingdom, in the city. Now, whether he gets into the city itself or not, I don't know. We'll have to wait for the judgment. So that gives hope to people. And uh, that's a lot different than the, the Catholic ideas that we have inherited. But if you'll search, I'll give you a sheet that'll tell you about this. You can go through it and you can find for yourself here with a little guidance to show you where. The Bible is a big old book. It covers a multitude of topics and a person that's not completely familiar with it won't know where to look for anything. But I can give you where to look and how to put it together. That good, Paul? Thanks, brother. That that, uh, that makes sense. Okay. If you have that sheet, we send it out. Yeah, I can I can give it out. If anybody wants it. Put, put it in the chat, and I'll get it over to you. I sent it out to somebody here last week who was wondering about it. Anybody else? Discussion? Hey, John. Shalom, brother. Hi, man. Um, so, Jackson, how you doing? Good. You look good. <laughs> hey, do you do you receive Enoch as authoritative or no? Enoch, um, I receive well, Enoch. Enoch is five books. First Enoch. One Enoch. First books. Enoch. Yeah, it's got five books in it. It's a composite okay. work of five. There's one I definitely in there accept. And, you know, I've translated this book from Ethiopic and made it available to people in Hebraic English, so I'm pretty familiar with it. But um, the, the middle section from chapter about 37 to 70 is called The Parables or Mashalim of Enoch. I believe that we cannot understand Yahshua unless we take that Part seriously, because it is a complete description of the concept of the Son of Man. And as you know, Yahshua uses that title for himself over and over again. It looks like about 150 times in the New Testament, of course, with repeats. It's what he says he is, the Son of Man, but you can't understand what he's talking about there unless you have this part. And of course, among the New Testament people, that book had a, a lot of influence on their doctrine. And so when we see Yahshua speaking of the Son of Man, the only place we could really find that explained is in those 33 chapters of the Mashalim or parables of Enoch, in first Enoch. The rest of that, it's, it's almost too high for me, but that particular portion, definitely. Obviously, the first book there, the jo Book of Giants and so forth, that was accepted, though they didn't have a canon in the days of Yahshua. That was certainly accepted because it's quoted as you know, in the book of Jude, and probably was quoted in Second Peter, but was redacted out. In the first century, the Pharisees, when they got their hands on Judaism after 
the destruction of Jerusalem. You know, they were really the only sect that came out good because they were, they had collaborated with the Romans and they commanded that those books like Enoch weren't to be used anymore. They were to be destroyed. So why right, is- What is your personal opinion? Is it, is it, is, do you accept the information in it as uh, important yes, for do. our faith or- I don't accept. Okay, it. because in I don't accept well, because it. in uh, yes, you know Enoch twenty two makes it clear that there's a hollow place for the spirits of the righteous and the wicked, or a place where they go, you know, upon physical death. That's the uh, you know where they're awaiting where they're awaiting judgment. There's a place for the wicked and a place for the righteous. So. No, that doesn't I don't, really jive. I don't with... trust that. No. 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 That's an old testament type of understanding. There's something new happened when Yahshua comes along in the new birth. There's something new happening. That is an old idea carried over from paganism. Of course, it's in the Bible. That's what they believed. Sheol and so forth. But Yahshua teaches us yeah. differently. He teaches us. Well, it seems like the, the story of the rich man and Lazarus perfectly coincide with uh, First Enoch twenty-two. Okay, but uh, <laughs> it sounds like he takes uh, takes the parable of the rich man and Lazarus right out of First Enoch twenty-two. So you may well have uh, done just that. you know just some thoughts for everybody to consider. Well, let me mention that in uh, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, first of all, it is an allegory. It's meant to stand for something else. And second of all, it it talks about Hades. Hades is in Greek religion. It's a Greek god. It's a place of the abode of a Greek god. Why does he use that? Because this these people had been forced into the Greek religion for 300 years now. And if there were churches, then they'd all be teaching Greek religion because they had to. Roman religion, the Judaism, you could practice that underground, but not much. Thirdly, that parable or allegory is a story from Greek mythology. And it, let me see if I can remember the name of it. Um, it has to do with the river sticks and people that died and went down in the underworld. Um, it's directly out of Greek mythology. That's what the people would have known. They wouldn't have known any of this stuff about spiritual life or spiritless humans or being born again. Even the teacher of Israel didn't know that. So there is a lot here that needs to have a light put on it so we can see it clearly and where it's coming from. You can't blame people for what their teachers say. And I can't force you or anyone else to believe any way I do. All I can do is give you something that you can go through and make a decision yourself. But no, I don't accept that anymore. Of course, in the Baptist church, I probably did. And I got to hear about going to hell every Sunday, but no. Nope, they might end up in so hell. So you pick and choose. You pick and choose what you believe in the book of Enoch. Absolutely not. I take a look at the timing. When was this book written? What kind of influence was it under? Was it uh, anointed or authoritative? And the one place in there I know is, is the mashalim, the parables in the middle. Go read it and see. What you believe, as far as those things go, is really irrelevant to the yahad, because we don't take a stand on that. This is part of the unity and diversity philosophy. You believe what you believe. We'll try to give you as much truth as we can. But in the end, we're not going to part about that or get mad about that. 
because we can't prove anything. Neither can you. No, no reason to get mad about it, but I know we received the Book of Enoch, obviously, for, for calendrical reasons and for the Son of Man teachings and for many other things. Yeah. So, you know, personally, when I read in, you know, Enoch 22, that there's a place for the the, the, the souls of the wicked dead and the souls for the righteous dead, you know, I embrace it. And I think that's consistent uh, to do so. And, you know, you can't pick and choose what you're going to believe. Uh, if you're going to believe, you can believe. If you're not going to believe it, okay. then you got to reject it all. You can't you okay. know, pick things at, you know. I believe what Yahshua that... says. Yahshua's word is paramount for me. If it's, it contradicts Enoch, if it contradicts Paul, I'm going to take the Messiah's word on it. And I just gave you the Messiah's word that he explains specifically and in depth in uh, John 5, 6, 7, and 8. So uh, where what is it that a person that is a, a natural person dies? What is it that goes someplace? What goes someplace? Well, it's a, it's a spirit. I mean, you know, we know that angels are in, you know, we know that angels are in a holding place. Um, because, you know, because they, they were created die. eternal. Angels can't. Because they were, they were created eternal. We, we know that demons are sent to a place uh, at times uh, based on the Gospels. And they, that's the souls of, you know, disembodied souls of the Nephilim. Uh, which are half human and half um, angel. And we know that man was told in the garden, don't eat from the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Yes, lest you will die. So men were made to be immortal if they never sinned. So there's a part of a man that is immortal. Yes, the body is temporal, but there's a part of a human being that is immortal. I, I don't understand that exactly, but that's how I see it. I also know in, the, in Revelation, it says that the souls of the martyrs cry out day and night, you know, uh, for for justice. And so does the blood of Abel. You know, so there's there's there are things scripturally that seem to lend itself that, you know, Though the body dies and rests in the grave until the body is resurrected and, and made immortal or resurrected to judgment, you know, uh, you know, like the way I look at it is if the wicked are going to be annihilated in judgment, well, why should they be resurrected at all for judgment? If they're if they're dead and gone, why wouldn't the father just leave them dead and gone? Just leave them. They're gone. They're judged. They're gone. But instead, there's something there of the wicked that need to be resurrected and judged. And, you know, to me, that lends itself to they're waiting. They're awaiting a resurrection. So, you know, I don't know why the father would resurrect a dead body and then judge it and then annihilate it once again. To me, it, it doesn't make sense. That, that's That's kind of conjecture. But you know, some of my thoughts, I just wanted to give a little balance to the people listening and have an opposite opinion and, you know, uh, unity and diversity, right? Yeah, I uh, listened to what you had to say, and I think there are some things that you need to know about it that might might help you and might not. But those kind of things, I can only give you my opinion based on the scripture that I know and read. Uh, the thing about Revelation, that word is not souls in the first place. The word is sukos, which means a person's being. In Hebrew understanding, there is no such thing as a soul. A soul, when the, the word sukos is used in Greek, the Hebrew word's nefesh, which means the being, that is, the body and the mind. Those two things together equal the nefesh. And the life life is in that. Um, 
but as far as him resurrecting the dead, isn't this the whole matter of what the Pharisees were coming after Yahshua constantly about? The resurrection of the dead? I, I don't think that when a person dies, they live on. There's nothing there in a Hebrew sense of understanding that lives on. There's nothing that lives on, but there is a resurrection, and I'll tell you why. Because for these people that are, uh, they're not born again and never die, according to Yahshua, then there's got to be a way to judge people, whether they're born again, second, whether they're good, or whether they're evil. It says, if a person's born again, they never die. This is Yahshua. If a person's good, then they get to live. If a person is evil, he gets a trial. So when they come back, it's essential that somebody who is scheduled for annihilation to be rightly judged with all the cards on the table. And that's why he's put aside a time for that to happen, which is probably in in God's time already happened or happening right now, since everything happens at once in that time. And it's not easy to explain. And we've got a lot of material that is contradictory. So uh, for me, the standard is the words of Yahshua. That's the standard. And secondly, maybe to the apostles, but mostly Yahshua. And when Yahshua doesn't speak of it, your guess is as good as mine. Your exegesis is as good as mine. I do know the whole idea of Sheol in the Old Testament was a thing that came from the pre-Yahwist pre Egyptian theology of paganism that carried on. It's like sacrifices. It carries on in the time of Yahweh because those people knew no other way to worship but through sacrifices. They knew no other way. They didn't have congregations where you come in and raise your hands up and speak in tongues and that. All they were to do was to bring their sacrifices in, and then they knew well, their sins were forgiven or whatever, and even that even once a year in Judaism. But uh, that was a carryover. And it's spoken of, for instance, in the Nazarene Acts. Peter tells us exactly that that was permitted because that's all they knew for worship. It's the same thing with these other ideas about Sheol. Yahshua comes as the new Moses to explain these things. And Peter Kifa also says, if you want to take the Nazarene Acts or the Clementines to be what they say they are, that uh, he came to set the record straight. He's the new Moses. He came to explain these things, which he does succinctly in several chapters, at least this thing about life and death. In uh, as I said, math or John chapter five, it is essential. That is a signature message that I want to get out everywhere. And that is that there are three classes of resurrection, and that overlays whatever other pagan philosophies, no matter where they come, whether they come from Egypt or Gnosticism that's out there. He overlays them. In fact, he's known as the new Moses because he explains these things. And it's just too bad that we don't have more of his material than we do. Perhaps that's purposeful. So yeah, I, I don't I don't blame you uh, for believing or wanting to counteract what I'm saying. That's all right. That's why that's why a person gets to say what they want to hear. But I have a different way of understanding that. 
And as long as I'm having an opportunity to preach, I will probably preach that. One of the intentions I have for a series on primitive things is, of course, John chapter 5. So I can show once again, once again, and again, and again, the idea of Yahshua preempting all these other things, including sacrifices. You know, if I was to talk to a Jew at that time, he'd say, get rid of sacrifices. You can't do that. That's the way we get our sins forgiven. Yahshua says, I came to do away with sacrifices. And indeed, he does, and he proves it by the destruction of the Judaism that was. Just so another one pops up that's just about as bad. That's my opinion. I don't hold a canon. Yes, it's not what I pick and choose. It's what doesn't this, he say that you have the Holy Spirit to teach you now? That's what I look for, not my favorite doctrines. I don't want to be a liar. I don't want to tell people untruths. So personally, I've got to be sure these things. I've made a life out of this. I don't want to be dishonest. Just because I think something doesn't mean it's true. These issues have far bigger and wider uh, influences than we can, as a, a person, anybody can, figure on their own. So we have to take a text to the throne room and lay it before Yahweh and lay ourselves before Yahweh and see what he says on these things. That's one way that a minister, somebody that wants to speak, can make sure of what he's saying, to bring back the message from Yahweh. I don't mean to overspeak this, but I think as a, as a comeback from what you said, I have to let that out. Just tell you what I think here. Zara does mean seed. It's got two meanings. I looked it up. It also means breakthrough, like a seed breaks through. Yeah, you know, when I'm when I put something out like this, I check everything that I can find to make sure that I'm not telling you a lie like all those false prophets in churches and on YouTube. I don't want to be like them. I don't know any of them. I don't want to know them. I want to stay clean. And there are people here that know my life and maybe would testify that my life has, has shown this kind of commitment. Okay, anybody else? Sorry to go so long. I don't mean to be defensive. Marcia will testify. She's known me her whole life, practically. Yeah, how about that? If that's all for today, I want to thank you, John. It's important for you especially to speak up. And I do appreciate it, and so do the rest of us. Because most people believe just as you do. That's not going to change your salvation or mine just helps us to be together more so we can understand each other. Okay, well, let's finish this up. And thanking Elohim for his commitment to our ministry and to our mission. And until we meet again, Yahweh be with you all.